Monday's lesson, Deuteronomy, ask us to read Deuteronomy 4.13. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and then wrote them on two stone tables. And we really want to finish what's coming up in the lesson today. Are the Ten Commandments eternal? No. They were added. They were added at Sinai. They weren't in Eden. They weren't in heaven. Lucifer didn't have a law about um, sins passing down to his, his posterity. Understand, they didn't have a mother and father he needed to honor. The Ten Commandments are written for the human condition based on the principles of love for God and love for each other. The principles of love were in existence, but these particular manifestations were added because of their need. Um, a book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 109, the author writes, the will of God is expressed in the precepts of his holy law and the principles of this law are the principles of heaven. Do you understand the difference between precepts and principles? Precepts. Precepts would be the rules, the Ten Commandments. They're, they're precepts, they're written instructions, they're directives. That's a precept. Principles, though, so are love for Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and neighbor as yourself. That's a principle. So the precepts of the, of the Ten are based on the principles of love. That's what that means. And the principles are what was the law of heaven, not the precepts according to the author. But in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. Why do the angels not render service in the spirit of legality? Because they do not consider God's law imposed, imperial, man-made, legal. It, it's not how it works. Continuing on with this author. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels as an awakening, something unthought of. Now, what kind of law can that be? There's a law. It's in force. You're expected to live in harmony with it. You don't know about it. Design law. Only design law. That's the only, only kind that can work this way. Any type of human law requires it to be posted. You have to be informed about it. How can you be expected to obey a law you know nothing of? Unless it's how reality works. And so Isaac Newton tells all his friends one day, hey, I discovered a law of gravity. Can't you see here his friends going, gravity? There's a law about that? I, I never considered there was a law, just how things work. That's the only kind of law that can be enforced without people actually really realizing there's a law. It's just how reality works. That's God's law. So in heaven, there was no, no law written on stone. It wouldn't have made sense to the beings in heaven. Second paragraph of Monday's lesson. When you think about what a covenant is, prepare, folks. Get your nausea bucket. Okay. <laughs> When you think about what a covenant is, the concept of law is an integral part makes sense. If we understand the covenant as, among other things, a relationship, then some sort of rules and boundaries need to be drawn. How long would a marriage or a friendship or a business partnership last if there were no boundaries or rules either specifically expressed or tacitly understood. The husband decides to take a girlfriend or the, or the friend decides to help themselves to the other's wallet or one business partner without telling the other invites a person uh, to join their venture. These acts would be a violation of rules, laws, and principles. How long would these relationships last under such lawless circumstances? That is why there have to be boundaries. Lines must be drawn. Rules established only through these can relate relationship be maintained. It's sick. It's twisted. Perverse. It's gross. It's sad. What is the essential elements for a healthy, godlike marriage? The right rules. <laughs> yeah, a transactional arrangement. A transactional legal arrangement that you can take them into a court of law if they don't comply. If you don't have that, strong enforcement. It's sick. You guys said it, what's required is love and trust. What kind of law can you legislate, can you pass, can you enforce that will cause someone to love and trust you? Think that through. We have to have rules. We have to have laws. Without it, can't have a good marriage. So what laws do you want to pass on your spouse? What happens to a marriage when it's based on rules and laws? The divorce rate goes up.
So Paul writes to Timothy, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that law was not, is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slavers, trade, slave traders, liars and perjurers, for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that forms the glorious gospel, the blessed God, he, which he entrusted to me. Who is the law given for? Why? What's its purpose? We're talking the written law now. Diagnosis. It's diagnostic. It's like an MRI. What, MRIs were built for the perfectly healthy people with no disease. No. no, they were built for sick people to find the disease, to expose it. Does the MRI cure anything? No. No, the law cures nothing. It simply diagnoses sickness. That's all it does. It was written like the mirror. We look into get convicted, there's something wrong with me. To take us to the physician, to cure the sick, sinful heart. For the lesson to suggest that our relation with God requires rules and rule enforcement is one of the grossest perversions of God's character possible. It perverts the gospel and obstructs God's healing plan. Does this mean that we are lawless? We're teaching there's no law. Not at all. Not at all. It means that, the, that God's law is a living law, and it is the law that requires our voluntary cooperation with. And this is why the Holy Spirit, God says, Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by the way the Spirit works, says the Lord. And the Spirit is the Spirit of truth and love. So imagine, when you give your spouse or child a hug, do you think, well, the law requires that I hug them. Uh, I, I, I want to be obedient. I, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to demerit in my heavenly record. I don't want to have legal punishment. I'll do my duty. I'll give them a hug. That's what the law requires. They better hug me back. And they better hug me back. <laughs> hey, you didn't hug me, and I don't want you to get in legal trouble. I love you so much, I'm going to spank you till you hug me. Exactly right. <laughs> or the example of marriage the lesson used husbands and wives think well i sure would like to commit adultery but i don't want to get in legal trouble so i won't cheat on my spouse because as the rules say i can't if it wasn't for those pesky rules though i sure would Haven't you already sinned? Uh, but isn't that a happy marriage folks you want a marriage like that no. we're only safe we're only safe because on stone it says you shouldn't commit adultery if it wasn't for that, written on stone, we're in trouble, folks. Or we wouldn't have any safety in our marriages. It is foolish to teach such things. Just as Paul says, only perverts, those who pervert God's law, think this way. Understand, perverts are not just sexual deviants. Perverts are all these legal penal theologians that keep perverting the character of God and perverting the idea of God's law. They're the perverts. They pervert the entire construction of God's universe. The people who, who crucified Christ as a lawbreaker were perverts. They perverted reality. More to the point, they perverted themselves. They perverted themselves, that's right. How do you explain, if God, isn't, if, we, if God isn't the enforcer of rules, the commandment, you shall not make unto you an idol, form anything in the heavens above the earth beneath, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, yet showing mercy to thousands of generations. You worship the wrong God, God will punish your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. The commandment says it. It's written in stone by God's own finger. How do you understand it? If you have imposed law, he's, he's a sovereign. That's just what he does. It's, 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 it, God's ways aren't my ways. I can't understand it. It's just the way he does things. It's the right. It's right. You've got to enforce rules. got to enforce rules. He's only doing this to protect. Well, before you answer the question, you should consider Ezekiel 8, 18, excuse me, Ezekiel 18, 
where in Ezekiel 18, the Lord says to them, the word of the Lord came to me, to the prophet Ezekiel, what do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The father eats sour grapes and the children's teeth rot. Why are the children, and, and it goes on to say, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb. Suppose there is a righteous man who does what is right, he follows the decrees and keeps the faith of the Lord, and the man, uh, that man is righteous. He will surely live, but suppose he has a violent son who sheds blood. Will that man be uh, live? No, he will die because of his sin. But suppose the son who's done wickedly has a son who does righteously. Will he die for the sins of the father? No, he will not die for the sins of the father. He will live because he has been righteous. And he goes on back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, describing that the sons will not, the son shall not share the guilt of the father, nor the father the guilt of the son. He will not do it. None of the offenses of the, of the one who's committed them, if they, be, if they repent, which he tells them to do, will be remembered. But then, then the prophet says, but you say the way of the Lord is unjust. Is my way unjust, says the Lord? Is it not your way that is unjust? You read the whole chapter 18. So here we have the commandment saying God will punish your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids for your sins. And we have God saying to the prophet in Ezekiel that the sin, the son will not suffer in the guilt. How do you understand those? Are they contradictory? Are they, do they harmonize? Are they both true? Which is the inspired one? Imperial law cannot explain this. Design law explains it perfectly. Perfect harmony. How does it happen? The commandments are describing God's construction for life. He built us in his image and gave us capacities to procreate children in our image. And we construct, construct children in our image biologically and environmentally. And when you commit sin, you alter your DNA expression epigenetically. And you not only pass along your own DNA sequences, you pass along the epigenetic structures that pass down three and four generations. And you will pass along disadvantages to your children three and four generations down that they will have more difficulty, greater temptation, and propensities towards the same struggles that you indulged yourself in. And then you also raise them in an environment and teach them ways of thinking and practicing and they observe you and by beholding they become changed. They behold mommy and daddy and how mommy and daddy function and how they act and they assimilate into their own characters some of the same principles. And so God is describing the law of worship here. And it's exactly what he's describing. If you have other gods and then you worship other gods, your kids will learn to worship other gods. It's going to pass down generations. And so God will punish through his original design for us, both biologically and characterologically, and his continued sustaining of those laws without change. They continue to operate. But he shows mercy to a thousand generations, as it says in Ezekiel, by anyone, despite their birth, despite their childhood upbringing, despite the corruption they might get from their parents, if they see the light as it is in God and repent and come to him, he shows them mercy and he heals them. Both are true, but only design law gets you there. <laughs> 